and Suki Hotu to all our viewers who are tuning in. Today is our second session of our Dharma Sharing series on Breaking Myths by Dr. Punya Wong. If you have missed our first session, Breaking Myths, Religion, Yanas and Lineages, you are still able to view the recorded version on our Facebook page. Tonight, our Dharma Sharing is entitled Breaking Myths Number 2, Sharing of Merits. Let me now introduce our distinguished speaker for tonight, Dr. Punya Wong. He's currently an Associate Professor in Internal Medicine at Monash University, Malaysia, based in Johor Bahru. He's an established Dharma speaker who has been regularly sharing Dharma in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta, Manila, Ho Chi Minh City, and Bangkok for the last two decades. He had also been invited to speak at the 3rd, 7th and 8th Global Conference on Buddhism. And due to the recent COVID-19 pandemic, in this era of new norm, Dr. Wong's focus has now shifted to sharing Dharma online via Zoom, Facebook and even WhatsApp. So Dr. Punya Wong has just recently published a Dharma book comprising a collection of sharings on the theme of breaking myths. So tonight, we have the honor of having Dr. Wong here live, sharing with us his newly launched ebook entitled Breaking Myths. Just launched on the auspicious Malaysia Day on September 16. So without further ado, I shall now hand over to Dr. Punya Wong for his Dharma sharing tonight. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Good evening, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Warm salutations from Johor Bahru. So glad to be able to see you all, at least on the internet, and share the Dhamma. Today is the second time I'm given this honor of sharing the Dhamma with you all. And I would like to first bring your attention to this picture. Many of you would be familiar with this place. This is Kusinara in India, where the Lord Buddha passed into Mahaparinibbana. And here is a very young me offering a golden robe with five of my friends. I will bring you back to this picture again subsequently. But this is a practice many of us do when we go on pilgrimage. We make that golden rope in Malaysia and then bring it along to be offered. Now, today we are going to talk about transferring merits or sharing of merits. And we're going to look at what is in popular religion versus what is in the Buddhist teachings. Now, as I shared last week, what is practiced in popular religion may be consistent with the Buddha's teachings or may not be consistent with the Buddha's teachings. And of course, while many of these things that is done plays a role in providing psychological support and comfort, as we walk this path, we have to be aware as to what it is that the Buddha taught versus what is it that we do because of tradition or culture. Now, many people have a concept of making merits. And to them, this is almost like saving spiritual bitcoins in a celestial bank account. Hence, you will see during exam period, for example, in Malaysia at the end of the year, well, lots of people make merits because they believe that, ah, by doing so, you may help my son or my daughter do well in his or her exams. So many people believe or are led to believe that this celestial Bitcoin or currency or merits can be shared or transferred to others 
almost like how you do online banking. And while this banking system of spiritual currency is completely alien to the Buddha Dharma, it is an attractive idea nonetheless. Now, what is the Pali word for merit? It's punya. Punya implies something favorable, something good, a meritorious action, virtue, a good deed or a good act or a good work. I mean, what is virtue? Wisdom is knowing what to do. Virtue is doing it. So it is an act. And punya karota would mean to do good deeds, to do good works, to do good actions. And here is an important thing that we as students of the Buddha Dharma must recognize. It is not making spiritual currency as though merit is an object that is separate from the act that we do. Many people seem to think, I do this good act. From me doing this good act, somehow there is a celestial addition, an addition to my merit somewhere in some celestial account. But that is not correct because what you do, that wholesome act, that act is not separate from your merits. That act itself is meritorious because that act is making you a better person. It is that imprint in our mindset, in our mind state, which is important, which creates karma. It is not a separate bank account. Now, this is a fundamental teaching of the Buddha Dharma. I am the owner of my actions. Not the word actions. The word kamma, the Buddha said, is chetana. And chetana is intentional actions or volitional actions. Actions that I intentionally want to do. So I'm the owner of all these actions. Heir to all these actions. I'm born of my actions. I'm related through my actions. And I have my actions as my arbiter. Whatever I do, for good or for evil, to that will I fall heir. And the Buddha said that this is something that we should always reflect on, whether you are a lay person or a Sangha. So if one of you is stopped in a bus stop outside Subang Jaya, and someone asks you, oh brother, who is your creator? You can very confidently answer, Kama is my creator. I am here because of my actions. And similarly, whatever actions that you do now will contribute to next hour, next day, next year, next decade, etc. You are the owner of that intentional action. You are the heir of that action. You are born of that action. You are related to that action. And you have actions as your arbiter. Subhanjaya Buddhist Association and I have a common link in the late Bhante Mahachara. Because I knew the late Bhante Mahachara for many years, and the late Bhante Mahachara had an affinity with Subhanjaya Buddhist Association. Through that action, now we are related. So when we understand this, you understand that Kamma or our intentional actions and its results are distinct and specific to each individual. It cannot be divided up like a pizza to be shared with one or other. And while you may be misled to understand that one's good deeds, yes, your good karma will certainly have good vipaka or good effect. You may be misled to understand that this can be transferred to loved ones, alive or dead, passively by the mere chanting of a few words. And this is very consoling, but unfortunately, there is no basis for it in the Buddha Dharma. 
the Buddha was very clear. He clearly stated that it is only those people who are aware of the good deed that is being done either on their behalf or shared with them will benefit. In reality, it is their knowledge and rejoicing at the good, wholesome deed that is done that is the cause of their own merits. As I said, we cannot share wholesome deeds. We cannot share karma, but we can share happiness. So, for example, let us say Sister Li Ming did something very, very wonderful. She baked cakes for everybody in Subang Jaya Buddhist Association to eat. And not only that, she baked cakes and sent it to the nearest old folks home, the nearest orphanage. It made everyone so happy. Everyone was so happy because of this wonderful act. And even those of us in Johor Bahru who did not unfortunately have the opportunity to eat that cake, but when we heard that Sister Leaning, Leaning did all this good work, we say, wonderful, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. She's really very, very kind. And we rejoice in that good act. We are rejoicing in her happiness. We are rejoicing in her good deeds. And that can be shared. So when we rejoice, we create through our rejoicing, our own karma at that good actions that was done. And for example, if let's say someone's relative had passed on, this person is no longer in a position to make an offering. This person is no longer in a position to donate to an old folks home, for example. And here the loved ones go there and we say, on behalf of my late mother, father, auntie, uncle, we wish to make a donation in her name. May she rejoice in this wonderful deed that we had done. And if that person is aware, that person will be so honored that my descendants, that my relatives are doing this on my behalf. I rejoice that I have such good filial children. I actually create my own merits when I do that. I actually create through that act of rejoicing my own karma. It is not dividing a pizza and saying, here, take this, that's your share. So you will realize that this is a word that we are all familiar with, mudita. You rejoice at someone's good deeds, someone's success. Liming did very well in her exams. Congratulations. All her relatives and friends are happy. I didn't do well, but she did well. And I am rejoicing in her good deed, her good act, her achievement. Mudita, this is one of the four Brahma Viharas. Anumudana, a word we use so loosely, literally means rejoicing with or after. It is asking beings, come rejoice in this good karma that one has done, be it offering a lunch dana, be it a donation to someone needy, whatever that wholesome act is, come rejoice with us. We are actually inviting other beings to rejoice at a wholesome act. And by doing so, they create their own karma. So if you look, karma is the intentional action. And vipaka is the result of that action. Ying guo. With every coming action, there will inevitably be a result. If I eat a cake, I will feel full. If I drop a glass, it will break. So every action will give rise to a fruit, a result, or a reaction. And every time you offer fruits on the altar, the Buddha is not going to eat it. That fruit that you offer on the altar is a lesson to remind us of karma vipaka. For within a fruit is the seed. And from the seed will bear a specific fruit. So every volitional activity, volitional, intentional activity, is inevitably accompanied by an effect. And since karma may be good or bad, 
wholesome, unwholesome, vipaka is similarly so. And as karma, that intentional action starts in our brain, in our mind. It is a mental action. So vipaka, the result, is also mental. It is experienced as either happiness or unhappiness. So by now, I hope you realize why these four Brahma Viharas the Buddha taught us is so important. Whether we are dead or alive, practice the four Brahma Viharas. And in today's context, mudita, appreciative joy, the pleasure of finding joy in the happiness and success of other people becomes very relevant. In the Kaladana Sutta, found in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha clearly said that if, let's say, Sister Liming offers a dana, that offer may be to the Sangha. It may not be to the Sangha. It may be to someone in need, to Subangjaya Buddhist Association. It could be something so simple as Dr. Punya Wong coming to KL and she takes Dr. Punya Wong out for hockey and me. Whatever it is, it is an act of generosity. So whatever that act of generosity, if it is a wholesome act, she will benefit from that mental joy, mental happiness now or in the distant future. But there may be others who are not involved, but they rejoice and they say, oh, Sister Li Ming is such a generous girl. Oh, she has made cakes for everyone in the orphanage. And we had witnessed that and we rejoice in it. Now the Buddha said, if you had witnessed that and you rejoice in it, mental action, mental result, you create your own merits. So while merit cannot actually be shared or transferred, for each of us is the heir of our own karma. It will be gained when a person rejoices in the good that is done. And hence, that common word that we use so often, sharing or transferring, because of its English implications, it is inaccurate. And we have to understand what we really mean. Now, on the other hand, you can also understand that if somebody does not rejoice in it, nothing is going to happen. So, for example, if you have a departed relative who is very stingy, who doesn't want to share anything, and he sees us, oh, making this offering, this printing of book, this offering of clothes to the unfortunate, he might say, hi yeah, this silly fellow, why are you wasting all the money? Do you think this person is going to create his own merits? The answer is no. Dedication of merits taken from a Malaysian website. This is taken from the same sutta that I mentioned. The wise give at the right time, in kind and rid of stinginess. A religious donation at the right time to the noble ones, upright and poised, given with a clear and confident mind, is indeed abundant. One that is important is what I mark and read. Those who rejoice at that and do other services, don't miss out on the offering. They too have a share in the merit. So you should give without holding back where a gift is very fruitful. The good deeds of sentient beings support them in the next world. Now the person who is transferring or sharing, for lack of a better word, he does not lose anything. And this is a very common question that is raised whenever people have Q&A. They say, if I share merits, if I transfer with them, will my merits all gone? No, you're not actually sharing or transferring anything. Certainly not through any celestial on bank, online banking. Your intentional action, i.e. your karma, to generously want to share or transfer is in fact very meritorious. That alone is dana. And remember, I told you it's in the mind. The person who wishes to say, I want to share this merit or transfer this merit does not lose anything because in reality, he is not sharing or transferring anything. 
how can punya, which means an action that you had done, for example, in supporting the poor, in giving, that helps you improve your mind, how can that clean the mind of another person? You can only clean your mind. I can only clean my mind. I can't clean yours. You can't clean mine. But I can certainly rejoice in you doing that good deed. And I always say, let me put it this way. If karma, either good or bad, can be shared, then certainly I will look forward to distributing all my bad karma when I die. And you and I know that is not something possible. So karma, remember, is intentional action. It is mind-made. And it is a purely mental action to begin with. And he has no instrument other than the mind. Now, all our acts are carried out through our body and our speech. But the body, for example, your hand, your legs, it cannot do anything on its own. If you have to amputate one of your limbs, do you think that that limb, after being amputated, can do anything? It can't. It has to be directed by the mind. Move your hand, then you move your hand. Same with our speech. So it starts off with the mind. As in verse 1 of the Dhammapada, mano is the word used. Mano means your intentional or intellect or cognitive or volitional capabilities or faculties. It is you think I want to do this. That creates karma. I want to share at Subhangjaya Buddhist Association. Then that will be verbal. I want to bake cakes. Then that will be a physical act. So karma is mind made. It begins in the mind. I took this from a writing by Bhante Agachita. He wrote, we should take note that the actual procedure of transferring or sharing merits is not mentioned in all the suttas I have referred to so far, nor in any other sutta in the Pali Canon that I am presently aware of. Should dedicate the offering, Dakki Namadese, seems to be the nearest hint found in Diganikaya 16. And if you wish to look up the exact article, the link is given there. Now, it is the responsibility of children of the subsequent generation to attend to their parents. And in the Sigalo Vada Sutta, children's responsibility are divided into five. You must attend caringly to your parents to provide them with whatever they need in their life to make them comfortable. You must carry out your family affairs, business affairs. You must maintain your parents' properties, clan name, religious duties, good name, lineage, etc. You must obey your parents and make yourself worthy of your parents' heritage. And I bring your attention to number five with the arrow. On the parents' death, they should do good deeds in dedication to them and share the merits with them. So, the practice of honoring departed relatives is clearly stated in the Sigalo Vada Sutta, Diganikaya 31, on the five responsibilities of children. The fifth one, which I just read, is to dedicate marriage to our departed relatives. Now, we can make two types of offerings. One, the direct offering of food and drinks to the departed ones, and two, dana to the sangha, or perhaps an institution, or perhaps the needy, followed by sharing of the merits to your daily departed. As I mentioned, number two will depend on whether they are aware and whether they welcome this act. So we have to educate our parents while they are alive. Now the Buddha said in the Janasoni Sutta to Janasoni in the Anguttara Nikaya, 
for those who with the breakup of the body after death reappear in the realms of the hungry spirits locally we call hungry ghosts he lives there he remains there by means of whatever is the food of the hungry spirits or hungry ghosts this is a very long sutta the buddha also did mention oh if you are a human being then you live in a human realm and you eat whatever is the food of the human being you're an animal then you eat whatever is the food of the animals etc but he specifically also mentioned that if you are in the re in the realms of the hungry spirits or hungry ghosts then you remain there by means of whatever is the food of the hungry spirits or ghosts he lives there he remains there by means of whatever his friends or relatives give in dedication to him this is the most direct reference to giving or offering food to our departed that i am aware of this is the little altar i have in my house honoring my late parents and ancestors in the tirukutta sutta it states that living relatives should make offerings of food and drinks to the departed ones here i bring your attention to two chinese words the first two words oops it literally means the house of the wongs or the clan of the wongs and this is because of a question that was raised and asked of the buddha when the buddha taught this someone very smart said what if i got no relative in that realm and the buddha said in this long long circle that we had gone through called samsara it is inconceivable that any one of us would have no relatives there so the buddha actually did specify that you offer to all your departed relatives not necessarily specifically to one or by name but to all and the chinese being very smart nicely put it as huang men which means the house or the clan of all the wongs in the janasuni sutta janasuni asked the buddha master gotama we brahmins give dana give offerings and do things in full faith thinking may this offering reach our departed relatives may our departed relatives make use of this dana master gotama can this dana whether tasi pao kentucky whatever reach our departed relatives can our departed relatives make use of this offering the buddha's answer was categorical he said if there is an opportunity they can if there is no opportunity then they cannot and the buddha went on to explain what do you mean by there is an opportunity and what do you mean by there is no opportunity in short offerings dana can only reach the deceased if he is reborn as a ghost i repeat offerings dana can only reach the deceased if he is reborn as a ghost conditions of non opportunity if one is born in the hell being in an animal in a human or as a deva then these offerings of food will not be useful because they will not know the devas will know but the devas do not eat your food hell beings do not know animals do not know humans do not know because they are already in someone's tummy the devas will know but they do not eat your food so it is only those who are reborn into the ghostly realm that are around that is aware that can either partake of your offering of food or rejoice in your sharing and the inverted comma of merits and that's why i say the word dedication or merits is much more appropriate because here you are doing something on their behalf in their name and saying i 
dedicate all this good act to so and so. Please rejoice, Anumodana, in this good act. And of course, as I mentioned, he must firstly rejoice in it. He must firstly even agree with what you are doing. If not, it's an exercise in futility. What about the Chinese culture of making offerings to gods and devas? I'm half Hokkien. My mom's family is Hokkien. My father is Cantonese. Those of you who are Hokkiens will know that on Chinese New Year, on the eighth day evening, there's a huge massive celebration of making offerings to Sakra, Tian Kung. Some rich families will offer, well, roast pigs like this, etc., etc. Some will offer fish, prawns, etc., etc. And we have just noted the Buddha teachers that the devas eat their own deva food. They don't eat our food. So what does all this offering mean? Now, in the Patakama Sutta, found in the Nikaya, the Buddha said to Ananda Piddika that a noble disciple who acquired his income through righteous means, that means righteous wealth, without breaking the five precepts, he should make use his money for five types of offerings. These are offerings to his relatives, support father, mother, wife, children, etc. To guests, to departed relatives, which we had already mentioned just now, to the king. Well, you have to pay your taxes, no one can escape. And the Buddha mentioned to the devas as well. This is interesting. He said to the devas as well. And in the Ratana Sutta, which all of us are very familiar with, there's a line which says, may the devas please protect these humans. They make offerings to the devas day and night. And then in the Mangala Sutta, it is mentioned that it is a blessing to be able to honor those worthy of respect. So it is our wholesome karma and wholesome act when we honor those that are worthy of honor. Now the word puja, many people think is prayer. Puja is not prayer. When you do your morning puja, for example, you're actually honoring the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. It is an act for you yourself to have this mental state of honoring someone who is our teacher, honoring the Dhamma, which is the truth, and the noble Sangha. So puja is that act of honor. So this answers the question, what is the point of making offerings to devas if they can't eat the food? But the devas may not be able to eat the food, but they are honored by your act of offering. And they may reciprocate by giving you protection and assistance within their means. Now I want to bring your attention. Please note that all the offerings to the Buddha image is similarly not used. It is our mental attitude of respect and honor and humility and the symbolic lessons in the offerings that is important. Remember my first picture I showed you when a much younger version of me went to Kusinara with five of my friends and we offered this beautiful golden robe at Kusinara at the very shrine that honors where the Buddha passed into Mahaparinibbana. Do you honestly think the Buddha is going to wear that rope? No, obviously not. It is our mental attitude that is important. So I hope you understand what I'm trying to share here. Now in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the Buddha advised people to offer dana to virtuous monks and dedicate the offering to the devas. These devas, being honored and cherished, in turn will honor and cherish the occupants of the house. And one may be protected and assisted by these devas within their means. So dedication of merits can reach the devas because they are aware and they benefit they create their own merits by feeling honored, by mudita, 
and in rejoicing. You know, very often before we start the sharing of the Dhamma, in some of the more traditional centers, they will chant the invitation for the devas to come and join us in this sharing of the Dhamma. In other centers, it is symbolic, ringing of the bell, tong, 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 so that everyone knows that Dhamma is going to be shared. Come, rejoice in this. This is from Nalanda. This poster, Patidana, dedication of merits. I'm in favor of this word because this is probably the closest dedication of merits. Nothing is shared, nothing is sent away, nothing is cut, nothing is divided. It is like, I dedicate this in the name of so and so. And just like water that flows from high ground to low ground, even so may our merits freely flow to relieve the pain and suffering of all beings. Now, when we are going to make an offering, whether to a venerable or a lay person, as I said, you can even make an offering to a lay person. Very often we make offerings of money, food to the needy. When you do this, that mental intention must be correct. That mental intention must be wholesome. Last week, we took our medical students to a monastery to offer the lunch dana. We taught them, you must bring your own food. You must rejoice before when you're either preparing or getting the food or buying the food. You must rejoice when you are giving the food. And you must rejoice after you had given the food. Because remember, it's in the mind. Karma is in the mind. And it is good that you give it with respect, carefully, personally give it. Don't send Dr. Tong to give it, then Dr. Tong will be a dewa. You know, I'm to do a donation. I'm not free like Dr. Tong. Can you go and give it on my behalf? All right? And of course, not with rejected items. That, that's not dana. That's getting rid of rubbish. And of course, understanding in the karmic effects. Now, this is actually in the suttas. In the Velama Sutta, the Buddha explained to Anatta Pindika that it is not what we give that counts, but your mental attitude is how you give it that is important. And it basically repeats what I just shared with you all. It is in the mind. So whether you are giving something very expensive or something very not expensive, it doesn't matter. It is in that mind, that attitude. Now, what did the Buddha teach? What I actually teach is this, the Buddha said. When a person, after rinsing his bowl, throws away scraps in a pond, wishing that the living beings there, the fishes, the tepos, whatever, may feed on these scraps, even that too is a source of merits. Why? Because it is that intention of wanting to help, not to speak of giving a gift to a human being. It is that intention. However, the Buddha said, I do declare that giving to a virtuous person who is free from greed, hatred, and delusion will bring greater fruit than giving to the immoral. So this suggests that there may be different grades and here I want to bring your attention to a very important teaching. The highest, of course, is when an ethical person with trusting heart gives a proper gift to ethical persons. And it is even higher when a passionless one gives to another passionless one a proper gift with trusting heart. This is mundane gift, a material gift. But I want you to see this. I credit Sister Sylvia Bay for typing this. My original one looked half as nice. So when I saw this from Sister Sylvia Bay, I nicely borrowed it from her. It's from the Velama Sutta again. And it begins by the Buddha telling you that if you offer to someone who is an Arya, maybe a Sotapan, it is very, very fruitful. 
Then if you give to someone who is even at a higher level of attainment, as Kandagamin and Anagamin, etc., it is even more fruitful. And so it goes on to Pacheka Buddha and even to a fully enlightened being, a Samma Sambuddha. And it goes on, it's even more fruitful to feed a Sangha, which means at least four monks hated by the Buddha. But I want you to take a look at the following ones. The Buddha said it's more fruitful to build a dwelling, especially for the Sangha of the four quarters. Of the four quarters means coming from any direction, not just specifically only my lineage, ah, no one else, ah, or only my one, ah, my yana, ah, no one else, ah, but the Sangha of the four quarters. Why? Because you are now giving a scholarship, a hostel to people who is going to train their minds. But I want you to pay attention to the next few because the next few is completely mental. We all took refuge just now, led by Brother Chuan. If you had done so with a heart that is pure, confident, genuine, taken refuge to the Buddha Dharma Sangha, that is even more fruitful than all that mentioned above. If you go to the next one, it is even more fruitful if you had undertaken the five precepts and keep it. Why? All the ones at the top can be done by anyone with money and with opportunity. But to keep the five precepts require that you have made a decision to change your life. That karmic consequence is very, very wholesome. And it goes on. It is even more fruitful, the Buddha said, to develop just loving kindness for as long as it takes to pull a cow's udder. That means to milk a cow. When you pull the udder, the milk will come. How long does that take? Just a thought. May all beings be happy, healthy, and well. May all beings be free from pain and suffering. And of course, meaning it. And not with, may all beings be happy, healthy, and well, except my mother-in-law. May all beings be happy and well, except they're gay. No, no, no. When the Buddha taught us metta, it is unconditional. It includes everyone in your family, including their cousin you don't like. It includes the drug addict down the street. It includes whatever yana. It includes everyone. And you must mean it. Again, you will know this is mental. It's a change in your attitude. And if you can do that, that coming effect, that vipaka is tremendous. And it is even more fruitful, the Buddha said, to develop the perception of impermanence, even for as long as a finger snap. How long does that take? Then to do all of these things above, including metta. Because when you develop the perception of impermanence, you are looking directly into the Dhamma. You are verifying the Dhamma by yourself. Sister Li Mei may be told, Li Mei, you have two arms and two feet. She may believe me and say, Yala, since Dr. Wong says so, I have two arms and two feet. I must have two arms and two feet. And then Sister Li Mei looks and says, yes, there are two arms here and there are two feet there. She has developed the perception that she has two arms and two feet. She doesn't need to believe Dr. Wong anymore. She knows. So similarly for all of us, the Buddha wants us to verify the Dhamma. Develop that direct insight and you will have altered your life, your mind state forever. So I summarize it here. Remember, what is above in giving a material thing, food, robes, medicine, Lodging, very meritorious. But it is even more meritorious to just take refuge in the Triple Jam with understanding, conviction, and commitment. It is even more meritorious if you can just observe the five precepts. Even higher is developing meta, genuinely. And the highest is when you perceive the Dhamma yourself. 
So I hope you realize, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, that these high merit so-called, they are all in your mind. Because Kama Vipaka is also in your mind. Now, here I'm going to share with you something which might lead to me being kicked out of a few more Buddhist societies. Now, very often in the Theravada tradition, we take great pride and go around telling everybody that ours is the original teaching of the Buddha. Straight from the Buddha's mouth. It becomes so conceited, so blinkered. I hope you realize that there is a lot even within the Theravada tradition that are later teachings, that are later things developed after the Buddha had long passed away. So we have to be humble. We have to realize that even within whatever lineage, there is a lot of new things that were added. And here is something that will shock you. I'm sure every one of you is familiar with the paramitas in the Theravada tradition, the 10 parameters, in the Mahayana tradition, the six parameters. I hope you also realize that these parameters are later teachings. They were not taught by the Buddha. These were introduced in the later scriptures, which is today collated in the Kuddhaka Nikaya. And according to the parameters, the word paramita means perfection, the highest supreme so according to this concept if you give dana and it is with the hope that by this act of dana i will have something in return you know nowadays there's a lot of religious organization you give 10 ringgit you get back 1000 you know or you give 100 you might get back 10000 you know that sort of attitude now according to this concept if you give dana and you hope that because I give this dana, my son will have good result. Because I give this dana, I will have a good husband. That is not dana parami. That is very mundane dana. Of course, even that act of giving is still meritorious. But it is very mundane. The best you can get is a mundane return. Fukpo. But if you do something without thinking, purely letting go, not for the sake of a return, not a spiritual investment, but purely because you know, I should do it because the person needs it. Then in this later teaching of the paramis, that is called dana parami. It is giving without thinking, asking, hoping for anything in return. And in the later teachings, this is truly gongda, without a concept of spiritual greed. In the Kuddhaka Nikaya, you will find the Buddha Wamsa and the Tariya Pitaka, which gives you stories written much, much later after the Buddha passed away about the life of the Buddha. And within there, the parameters become introduced. Show you a very interesting story here. Around 400 AD or common era, 400 common era, Kumara Jiwa went or was rather captured and brought to China. That was the first great translator being brought to Chinese soil, Kumar, Venerable Kumara Jiwa. Around 500 CE common era, Bodhidharma went to China. And in the late 500s to the beginning of the 600s, the Venerable Xuanzang did his amazing work of going to India and translating his sutras. But when Bodhidharma went to China, China was already a Buddhist country. It was the Liang Dynasty and the Emperor Liang Wuti was apparently a very, very devout emperor. And he asked to see Venerable Bodhidharma, because Bodhidharma was already very famous. And he asked this 
famous question out of three, we will only discuss the first question. He asked Bodhidharma, he asked what merits are there in all the work that I've done. So when the emperor met Bodhidharma, he very excitedly wanted to know what is my investment? What is my return? What is the profit ratio? And so he said, I've built many temples. I've supported the Sangha. I've built many roads and bridges. So how much merits have I accumulated? Bodhidharma replied, even without hesitant, any hesitation, none whatsoever, he said. That's a picture of Bodhidharma hanging right in front of me right now. Even Bodhidharma must see one. You see his bow is there. The emperor was very annoyed and dismissed Bodhidharma. He think this Bodhidharma useless fellow. And later he complained to his own spiritual advisor that the monk Bodhidharma doesn't know anything about Buddhism. When I asked him how much merits I have, he said none. The spiritual advisor paid his respects to Bodhidharma and said, Bodhidharma is indeed a great master. When he answered none, it is because you have greed for merits. One performs generosity without expecting anything in return. This, in the later teachings, is Dana Parami. Now, Liang Wuti, for those of you who may be interested in, is also the man who introduced vegetarianism to Mahayana Buddhism in China. He passed an imperial edict that all the temples, centers, monasteries, etc., that he supported must be vegetarian. And that is why Chinese Mahayana Buddhism has very strong basis on vegetarianism. So this is a non-canonical teaching, which may surprise many of you, that while each one of these qualities are praised by the Buddha, a set, as in these ten paramis, is not taught by the Buddha. But every one of them are very wholesome qualities that we would like to develop. So, meritorious deeds. I already explained punya. They are actions which actually purify ourselves. So if you do a meritorious action, that meritorious action arises out of non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. It actually helps you. And so it purifies your mind of these three evil roots. Now, the commentaries make this even more elaborate. This is again non-canonical. These are commentorial teachings. And again, many of you will be familiar with the ten meritorious deeds. This is actually in the commentorial tradition. And here you will see in the commentarial tradition that these become very important. These are all mental. The dedicating of the merit, the rejoicing in the merits of others, listening to the Dhamma, teaching the Dhamma, and of course, straightening your views. I bring your attention again to the importance of mudita. So you can share merits, not only from dana, because very often we think, oh, I must offer this, I must offer that. That is very meritorious. But actually sharing of the merits is not only from dana, it's actually from any wholesome act, such as meditation, even the sharing of dhamma. So like right now, we share the dhamma. This is meritorious because you have rejoiced, you have listened, and I have taught. And we can dedicate these merits to whoever you wish to dedicate them to. Now, you should not think lightly of doing good, thinking that a little will not affect me, because it's just like a water jar filled up by filling drops of rain. So if every day we make it an intention that I will do an act that is wholesome, I must intentionally do it. That becomes a hobby. That becomes a personality. That becomes your mind stream, little bit by little bit. And of course, Kayana meters are very, very important. If you have a group of Kayana meters who walk with you doing this, 
then life becomes much more enjoyable and easier because you all have a common ground. So please do all possible good. Please, any positive action by means of thought, speech, and action is kusala. It will give rise to some benefit. No matter how small that seed that you plant, you never know how big that tree will become. But anything that costs you your peace may be too expensive. So do not let your mental state be made unwholesome or negative because in your quest to do something good, you become worse. That means, to put it this way, in fighting the monster, you become the monster. Do not do that. Now, many of us, I'm sure listening in today, had already long withdrawn your EPF. If you look at our typical Malaysian lifespan of 75 years, we spend 25 years of our life studying very hard, at least another 25 years of our life working very hard, and hopefully by the time you are 50 to 60, you have accomplished your duties as a family man, your children are grown, they are independent, and you are now in your golden years, the last 25 years of your life. In the last 25 years of my life, I wish to do whatever good that I can do. Because time is a commodity that is ever decreasing every day. Every day I wake up, it is one day less. I am not interested in holding position. I'm not interested in status. I'm not interested in running anything. But I'm very interested in just being myself, doing good deeds within my means. I'm interested in sharing the Dhamma with my peers, with my good friends. But I will not let anything rob me of my peace. Because ultimately, it is your mind state. And I repeat, in fighting the demon, do not become the demon. Some of us do that, actually. So because the Buddha said, do not fear meritorious deeds. This is an expression denoting happiness. Brothers and sisters, if that deed that you are doing is not giving you happiness, something is seriously wrong. Get out. Because if you are doing a meritorious deed, it gives rise to happiness. So if you and your friends are doing something and it's making you more stressful, more unhappy, get out. Something is wrong. The Buddha said, do not fear meritorious deeds. This is an expression denoting happiness. What is desirable, wish for, dear and agreeable, that is meritorious deeds. For I know full well, the Buddha said, for a long time I experienced what I want, what I wish for, what is dear to me. And this is often from performing meritorious deeds. This is a very important teaching. When you do meritorious deeds, just do it. You will be happy. You will have a good, peaceful, content, happy life. And the smallest of actions is still better than the noblest of intentions. I keep teaching my medical students, I keep sharing with my Dhamma family here, Metta is a verb. Metta is not a noun. All that chanting, may you be happy and well, may I be happy and well, is very good. But it is even better if you act on it. Act on it. And I'm so happy that during the MCO period, so many of my brothers and sisters in the Dhamma rallied forward to help my medical students that were stuck in JB. We even offered them money. If you need money, just say it. We'll give it to you because we know everybody is in a difficult time. So the Buddha said, if you have a human birth, please do wholesome deeds. You will be happy. Now I want to end by sharing you with this story. There was this Zen master who lived in a little hut, a little kuti at the foot of a mountain. Bear Kuti. 
One evening while he was away, a thief sneaked into the hut, wanting to steal something precious, something valuable, only to find that there is nothing to steal. Kosong, ile. The Zen master happened to return and met the thief. And he said, oh, you have come a long way to visit me, he told the prowler. And you must not return empty-handed. The only thing valuable the Zen master had is his ropes, the cloth. In those days, cloth is valuable. And so he said, please take my clothes as a gift. So he took out his ropes. Bogel, naked, gave the ropes to the thief and said, please take this. So the thief was quite shocked. But he took the clothes and ran away. And the master sat naked, watching the moon. He said, poor fellow, I wish I could give him this beautiful moon. And the lesson ends. Now, Sister Li Ming is supposed to meditate on this for three years because you cannot logically analyze this. It's oxymoron. It's nonsensical. It does not lead to a conclusion if you sit down and logically analyze it. Your mind will go mad, but it will come to you like a snap of a finger and insight that is beyond a logical mind to analyze. What did, of course, Sister Li Ming don't have three years. Lah, huh? we are not in, she wants to be enlightened, I think, in three months, but three years is a bit too long. But it doesn't matter. Let's come back. What did the thief want? He wanted something valuable. All of us want valuable things. All of us want good things, branded things, valuable things. And so when the thief came into this little kuti, he wanted to take something valuable. The master met him. And the master said, oh, I have to do dana even to this man. Metta, karuna. I shouldn't be angry with him. I shouldn't scold him, curse him, beat him. Notice, he's living the verb metta. He's living the word dana. And he said, I've got nothing here to give you. The only thing I have is this three piece of rope that I'm wearing. If you want it, please take it. So took it out, gave it to him. And so now the master was bogel, naked. And he looked at the moon and he said, poor fella, I wish I can give you this beautiful moon. Because what is the most valuable thing to the master is not the ropes. What is the most Valuable thing to the master is that peaceful state of mind, appreciating that beautiful moon, which is nature. Dhamma is merely nature. Dhamma is merely that moon. You always say, finger pointing to the moon. See that, Sister Li Ming? We are now all looking at the moon. I wish I can give you the Dhamma. I wish I can give you the truth. I wish I can give you the moon, but I can't. Only you can want to have it yourself. I can give you the ropes, but that's not the most valuable thing. The poor fella refers to the teeth, thief going after what he thought is the most valuable thing. The most valuable thing is not that rope. The most valuable thing is nature, understanding, flowing along, the moon, the Dhamma. And that is something no one can give us. That is something you have to have yourself. So the Buddha is not a name. It's a title of a supremely enlightened being. The Buddha is not to be worshipped. We respect him, but we certainly don't worship him like you worship some other being. But we respect him. We want to learn from him. We want to awaken to the truths of life. We want to see nature. We want to see the moon. And we want to evolve to the higher spiritual state. Metta, karuna, dana. We want to be like that monk who says, oh, you want to rob me here? Take my rope. I have no hatred against you. Not easy. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do a little bit of merits. Thank you, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. I hope I have helped you in any way to make you a better person and to help you understand the Dhamma a little bit better. Thank you. I will stop sharing now. Right. Thank you so much. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.
Right, thank you, Dr. Punya, for such an interesting Dharma sharing session tonight. Yeah, one full hour of Dharma pack. Yeah. <laughs> so breaking this myth that we all may have had um, on sharing of merits, including those of uh, cultural influence, right? Um, by the way, uh, Dr. Punya, I wish I'm a good baker, yeah. <laughs> Although um, I do not bake, but I do rejoice with your wholesome thoughts. Yeah, after all, karma is all in our mind, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. okay. So um, without further ado, let's move on to um, question and answer time, right? Where we will take in questions from all our viewers to be answered by Dr. Punya. So I think we do have some questions here already. Yeah, let's take... Um, the question by uh, Brother Chim. Brother Chim Siu Jun has asked a question. Um, other than the Buddha, which devas or Brahma should one regularly honor? Saka Devaraja or the four great kings of Chatu Maharajika or Mahabaka Brahma or who else? Okay, that's a difficult question to answer because. While the Buddha did mention about the names of all these devas, I think locally we probably can add a few more. You have got the earth devas, you have got tree devas, now we have got condo devas, and I think much more. So, for example, in, in good old Malaysia, within our Chinese culture, every traditional Chinese family will have a little shrine to the earth deva. Even my condominium has a shrine to the Datuk Kung, the guardian deva of this compound. So uh, let's start with very down to earth things like let's make dedication of marriage to the guardian devas of this compound. Subhanjaya Buddhist Association, I'm sure every time you do dedication of marriage, you will say maybe dedicate marriage to the guardian devas of this temple, of this society, of this center, etc. We do not know their names, perhaps, but it doesn't matter. It's the thought. Our tradition, of course, within the Chinese Sakra, Hien Kung, especially in the Hokkien community, that's a very common one. And in the old house where I stayed, I used to stay in the landed property before I moved here. My family used to have a Tian Sen, a little altar to the guardian devas. All right, so we used to do that. Now, that's very cultural, so it's very easy to adapt into our practice. And this is something the Buddha said is useful because first it teaches us humility, that there are beings higher than us, that there are beings more evolved than us, and we will pay respect to them. I do not think, Brother Chim, you need to be very specific as to their names, all right? And some centers like Kota Tinggi in, jo in Johor, there is a little shrine to the four guardian devas. So yes, you can make... You can honor them, we can respect them to this uh, at, at that place. And um, I do not know what is available in Subang Jaya. If you go to the monasteries in Thailand, almost every monastery will have a little shrine to the Guardian Devas. If you visit a Thai friend at home, almost every house landed, that is, will have a little spirit shrine. It's very, very common in Thai culture. So. Every time we go past there, we will make a little offering of maybe a simple gesture or a joystick or a simple fruit. That is up to us. I do not think we need to be specific. I hope I had answered your question, Brother Jim. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Punya. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, although the time is a bit um, getting late, but I think uh, it's important for us to uh, answer this question um, posted by our viewer, JJ. Uh, when we do a good deed, um, are we supposed to reflect on it daily, you see, over and over again, rejoicing over and over again, yeah, that we have done a good deed so as to magnify this good deed that we have done? Okay. Now, I don't suppose we have to be neurotic about it because you're going to do, do good deeds every day. As I said, try and make it a hobby, and then after that, it becomes your personality. But having said that, there is something important at what you have brought up. And thanks to modern technology now, we have got digital cameras, we have got digital things to help us. So you've got an iPad, you've got your Android, etc, etc. And what I mean is that all of us will reach a time where we are going to be sick, old and dying. And when we are at that stage, it is important for us to recall 
the good things that we have done. Now, very often when we visit someone, a dear friend who is sick, we all go there and we all feel very sad that he's dying or something. And then we go there, some of us may cry. Some of us may keep on telling him, don't die, don't die, don't die. Now, you will realize that that actually becomes quite negative because you want someone who is dying to have a wholesome mind. And this is where your Android, your iPad comes in very useful. Because if you had taken photographs of all the good deeds that had been done, including your pilgrimages to India, all the dana, all the dhamma sharing, etc., and it's nicely now in your digital collection. I'm sure Sister Li Ming's handphone have a thousand pictures in there of <laughs> good and bad and everything. But we only show the good and go through the pictures and laugh and rejoice and see all these other whole things we had done. Look, we went on pilgrimage. Look, we went to Buru Budo. Oh, look, we spent a retreat, etc., etc. It builds up a wholesome state of mind. And that is what is very important for us to do in a near-death type of situation. So, well, of course, we do recall our good deeds. But remember, you're going to do good deeds every day, Brother JJ. You're not just going to do one good deed because Dr. Wong says so and then remember that good deed for 30 years, you know. You're going to do good deeds every day. So you don't have to keep repeating that one good deed you have done, although there's nothing wrong in doing it. But keep on doing good deeds. Remember, it's like drop, drop, drop of water. The Buddha's analogy is fantastic. It's like a little drop of water in a tongue. One day, that tongue is going to be full of water. So don't bother. Remember, try and develop dana parami. Do it without counting. Okay, wow, my bank account should be very big. Wow, I can write check. No, 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 no. Forget about all that. Try and attain dana parami. Just do it. Don't be like Liang Wuti. Start counting how much I have. No, just do it. Liang Wuti was told by Bodhidharma, none whatsoever, because what you wanted is basically fame, reputation, and to be praised. You've got your 15 minutes of praise, reputation as a great emperor. You have got everybody patting you on your back and saying you're a good man there. That's your football. That's your reward. So as far as Kong Tak, zero. Now that's a nice story, you know, nice story. And I repeat that story quite often to whenever I share. Okay. Li Ming, if I have time, I'll tell you the other two questions later on. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, what a great session. So um I shall now hand over to Brother Chuan for the closing of tonight's session. Right, thank you. Thank you.